in the name of Baseless 21, which is spread out uh, all over the chair, so I'm sure you recognize all of them, and Goethe Institute uh, to March Dance today. I won't take up much time introducing you because I observed during the tea break that pretty much you know everyone who is here today. <laughs> uh, so it's a very impressively close-knit community meeting and I don't want to take away any of your time. I just wanted to make sure that all of you know that there's the second part of the day today. Um, at 7 o'clock in the auditorium we will have Tanzanweisung. So please don't run away after this, no matter how inspired you are. <laughs> Stay for the second part, um, and now I hand over to you. Hand over to Perfect. <laughs> Hi, good evening everyone, welcome. Um, I'm Shanti, and uh, it was a great honor for me to be asked to um, moderate this conversation this evening with someone who needs very little introduction, especially since they know everyone in the room here today, as we just heard. <laughs> Which is but not true, I don't know everyone. <laughs> Um, and also uh, to be able to convene this event. Uh, oh, do you not hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do, do you want the mic? Yes. Yeah. 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 Off for the recording. That's yeah. okay. Good. Um, um, it's also a wonderful uh, opportunity to be able to convene this kind of conversation in the context of the workshop that we began today with Maya. Uh, I see several folks here who are participating in that, myself included. So when we thought through some questions for this evening earlier, we kind of kept in mind that there might be some things that people who are working um, in the mornings all this week might be especially interested in. So we're just going to kind of meander through some um, queries and um, questions largely related to process, Maya's process. Um, I think one of the most extraordinary thing, things that characterizes Maya's trajectory is the way in which she has formulated over a very long time um, a very unique, personal, but quite concrete process of improvisation. So I thought we might start there, especially because we were improvising some hours this morning. And um, I thought that maybe you might want to say something at the start here of what improvisation is for you. Of course, this is a term that we use across different arts disciplines. Um, and there are many systematized, codified techniques of improvisation across music, dance, and theater. So I thought it would be interesting to consider what improvisation is for you. Um, I've actually written some things down, which I never like to read, but I think to stop myself from meandering, I will read it out at some point. But as you were ending your question, I was thinking, trying to think afresh, keeping in the light of the morning in, in, uh, session, which was all about take yourself by surprise. Surprise is like the key word of, of, of uh, the six day session that's happening here. And I told myself that even in this talk, I might have made some notes, but can I take myself by surprise? Even as Shanti asks the question, just so that uh, it feels like a continuation of the morning. And as you were talking, it came to me, and sometimes it's in these moments, and that is improvisation, that when you feel you're prepared and you have a sense of, I think it's going to go in this direction, and suddenly you disturb yourself because it mustn't. It mustn't go in the direction that you uh, had planned for. And so as you were ending, I was saying, what's coming to Maya, what's coming to Maya, what's coming to Maya, and this is what came to me that I think in improvisation, and this also largely comes from, largely comes from having absorbed what these 20 people were doing this morning, that I think I live far more fully when I'm improvising. I don't think I live life fully when I'm supposed to be living it. And I'm not trying to make some fancy statement like, oh, one is free on the floor and I can travel where I want to and it's, 
It's not that. There, there, is, there are secrets in this body that can only, I think, be unlocked when you give yourself 101 conditions for entering. It's not like you are letting yourself free. It's not laissez-faire. It's not, I'll do what I like. You give yourself 100 conditions before you enter a, a space of improvisation and suddenly you're battling with all of those conditions and you're colliding with them and you're talking to them and you're, um, I don't know, so many streams get unlocked. And if I may, I think some of this does come from, a lot of it for me comes from Kathak. One very main thing in Kathakali is the thing that we know the best, which is to open our mouth and talk and to set a thought going here or a something going there and let it flow out through here in terms of word. And words are something that all of us share. That one has been taken out of the game by Kathakali. The words have been given over to the singer. I will never look at that singer, he's standing behind me, and there are two singers there sharing my character's text. And we may not do a warm-up, but we've got a long training, and every single bit of the body has been trained for creating volumes inside of you, but never to speak, and that you will find, and that's, I think, what takes me into improvisation with a sense of uh, abandon, is that I've got the body ready to go and let it speak. Let it speak without speaking. So for many years, actually, when I would go into an improvisation, I would not speak because it felt so, the Hindi word is faltu. There's no need to speak and the speaking was done by the rest of the body because that's what Kathakali frames you for, for not using this to speak. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. So I want to ask you a question here. I'm going to, um, uh, I, I want to ground this a little more. When you say that the, uh, the body can generate volumes, you said, of what exactly? What is generated in that process? Oh. What I know from this morning's workshop, which came to me with clarity, is that um, that first you say breathe, then you say, then you learn to say, don't sense your breathing, but listen to your breathing. So you've already displaced. You're listening rather than sensing breathing, which is a bit <coughs> like, can you speak without talking? So this kind of displacement, what's, what did you ask me? What is generated? Generating. So, body. how does breath become energy? Breathing and breathing and breathing. I can let a little heartbeat enter the breathing, and then it already becomes hair standing on end, and a bit more breathing, and it can give me a sense of excitement and I don't know part of that excitement is in my body and some of it I, I <laughs> sense um, maybe behind her green sari and so without looking at it it's a sensing and a listening so the breath has become energy and from energy there's a, maybe a secret lying there and uh, I don't know something um, it's perpetually transforming something is getting transformed and I must wait to know, uh, not maybe not to know how you, what you, for me the, the the beginning is breath, the beginning is breath, but you get trained in Kathakali to know that that breath is going to transform into something, because the guru will say, hey, can I see breath in the eyes? Why you kudku? Give it breath. What the hell does that mean? What does it mean to give breath to the eyes? You don't look for that meaning. You, you just go with it, go with it, go with it. And before you know it, it is already transforming. And where it went from breath into expression and into um, um, uh, cupping some energy or uh, sensing it or giving it on or getting it back or... You're putting yourself in a state... Uh, I mean, for me, the best word is surprise. I have no idea 
how this breath is going to transform. But I'm waiting. For me, the big word is waiting. So you put, perch yourself in a state of excitement when you're listening to your breathing and letting it take you places. Is all the, the, the eye. But the rest of it, of course, is training. Because it is, um, you see, it's this combination of displacement. So you're not speaking from here, but you're speaking from there and he's doing some of the speaking by singing it, that's already a displacement. He's taken Ravana's thoughts and put it into verse and he's taken it over. That's displacement. But there's fragmentation along with the displacement, which is that my training is in the wrist and in the feet. The feet will dance. This will create meaning. And this for me is the most important value that I've got from Kathakali, I think, that takes me into the space of improvisation that this character's what it wants to say will get made in that space between the character and the audience. It will not get made inside of the character. It will get made there. If Ravana has to create that mountain, it's going to get made there between uh, you and me. And therefore, I'm part, I'm part performer, I'm part actor. Because some of what the character wants to say and to get made is going to happen there. It's not going to be made, made inside of me. So I'm at the service of what's going to get made. I love that. Am I, does this sound like something that I'm at the service of something? The, the you want to show a clip now? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so great because I think they illustrate just how profound um, the exploration uh, of Kathakali has been because sometimes people may watch and say oh I saw this mudra or oh those are Kathakali eyes I saw her doing that in the workshop but we're actually dealing with someone who has deeply excavated and processed um, the underlying principles of that form and invested those principles into something that looks totally different so exciting to see that illustrated and um, you know, you have to play games with yourself when you are solo, because you have no director. Uh, you, uh, there's nobody to tell you anything. And so you have to step out of yourself and talk to yourself. And so sometimes, for many, many years, I kept Kathagali out of the door because I was petrified of that I will use an element of Kathagali and I, I don't like that kind of theater. And I don't like that performance where we are looking at a where we, we tell ourselves we are in a form that I'm in Kathakali, but I'm playing with it. Uh, it that's, that's, that's not for me. So I have to physically say, stand outside of the door. But of course, that's wonderful. Because the moment you, that is tension. The moment you say, go away, then it will come in through the crevices. And I like the way that Kathakali has come to me through the cracks and crevices, and then friends will say, oh Maya, but I saw Kathakali there in that evening, that day. Sometimes I play games with myself. When I made a show called Ravanama, I told myself, you come and stand in the room then. Come on, Kathakali, come, come stand there. Be with me, because I've decided to make a show around Ravana. And for me, Ravana does not exist in the epics. For me, Ravana and his beauty exists in one particular story of Kathri. It inspires me no end. And so I said, come sit there, Ravana, with me. And the moment he came and sat in the room, I became the performer, who was free of, free uh, with a sense of what bit of Ravana will come to me now. And so one particular morning, I told myself, can I take a very daily object and start playing with it? This is tension for what we are in the, in, the, in the workshop, what we're talking about. That there's something in my hands which is very real and which resonates with daily morning tea, drinking, headlines, politics. It has a whole daily practice embedded in it. And yet, will it take me to the world of Ravana? And if it does, how will it do it? So I need some kind of sense of anticipation. I don't know how if this newspaper is going to transport me to Ravana. And so, where I then improvise, and my, uh, my shortcoming is that once I've improvised and I've put it up on video, I find it very difficult then to tinker around with it, to refine it, 
to make it ready for stage. Because then this Maya with this, 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 with the, where, the, where the mind takes the lead, I'm not very good with that. I'm no playwright. I'm no, I'm no director. Let's put it like that. I'm no director. I can go with whatever's bursting <coughs> from the body, but once it's there, then I maybe chop, clip something. Mm, uh, okay, that's okay. So here's a clip from playing with a newspaper. I played for a long time, and then this is the bit I chose. And I also told myself to feel that tension. I will play a shloka from this very favorite piece of mine, where in four lines, the singer is introducing the audience, the curtain of Tarashila is up, and the singer is introducing the audience to the piece that they're going to watch. And so I love the, it's so high, there's a, there's a high in those drums. And I'm whole, hoping that the high of those drums will take me into some other way of rediscovering mm, Ravana. And so this is what happened, and then I just neaten it up and how do we go full screen? <laughs>
and this tea mug and uh, I played with it for a long time here you're seeing a very edited uh, version but the heat coming of the mug and the and the uh, and the this turning and all of that text came from turning there's all this one I would not have taken uh, uh, it would not have come to me if I hadn't been feeling the tension of turning the pages of the morning papers and I think what happened to me uh, is that this this uh, the mudra that we create with the hand because we don't speak in Kathali I think I now because I was in another space in a more contemporary space the mudra became in the word which we've actually heard Kudiyatum people do they physicalize and put the mudra into their text in such a wonderful way which we don't. And one is always curious and excited by, can I do that kind of displacement without having to study the way they do their recitative stuff? How can I do what they do but find it in another place in my body? That's, that's what excites me. But if I were to sit and think about it, it won't come to me. I have to put myself in some state of excitement. And so I'm also talking to my these participants. You know now what I'm talking about, this putting your state. You, all of you experienced it in moments this morning. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. Maya, could we maybe watch the jogger clip right I'm now? I'm beginning to feel that you don't want me to jog. <laughs> no, not at all. I just find it so fascinating to juxtapose this, where we can perhaps more readily identify elements of Katakali with something that has also been churned through this fascinating improvisation process, but looks completely different from this character. The text is, the, the mudra text yes, yes. is completely uh, different. It's, it's fascinating the kind of breadth of um, material that can be generated through the process. You see, I just want to say this. When you make a word in Kathakali, it has a journey. It, it doesn't get just said. A go, ba, un, ta. It's not like that. There's a beginning and there's a whole journey of it in which the character invests <coughs> what they're going through in that moment. And then the mudra speaks back to the uh, actor, uh, character, and then you journey and journey. And there's a beginning of the end. This is why in our workshop also, you don't just get arrive at the end. There's a beginning of the end. And then not here at the end. And then not here at the end. Oh! So all that is very exciting. Now, uh, for me, when I'm improvising, you want to catch hold of one thing, and again, this is from this morning's workshop, you'll know what I'm talking about. If I catch a gesture or catch an action which has uh, come out of where I don't know, and then I have to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it to know what it is. I mean, I don't know what, what it is, but by repeating it, I will find what not meaning, but what significance maybe it has. So this now, I it helps me in comedy. Now, how does it? This is again displacement. You get an idea and you get obsessed. So many of my comic characters are uh, they are all women and they are all completely ridiculous women who are obsessed by something or the other. So this particular woman is obsessed with. And those were the days, this is, this is 1979, you may not find it funny at all, but uh, please forgive me, this is the kind of humor we had. <laughs> 25, what is 19, 1980, is many, many years ago, and those were the years, you'll find it all so passe now, when the Americans were telling us what it means to keep fit. 
and uh, all these little gyms were popping around all over the place and um, uh, I, I was, my mother was nice and round, my grandmother was even rounder, I was gravitating towards them and every sign of beauty from all the classical traditions told us you must have big bums and big boobs and nice round face and big eyes and I was in that tradition, believe it or not, I might have been a college girl who was wearing her blue jeans but for me roundedness meant many things. I am I'm being utterly honest here, I'm not being facetious. And when these gyms popped up, they, they were actually a bit of a, hey, what's going on here? Is this American invasion of another kind? You know, and I, I, I really was a bit worried. And so when you get thoughts like that, the only way to tackle them is through comedy. <coughs> to get it off your chest. So then this is what happened. Now, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. No. no. F is to go out of the Oh, F is to get out. Okay. And then F again? Across. Across. Uh, see, I'm uh, very illiterate on other machines. I don't forget. And uh, here we go. Anything else to be said? Um, no. <laughs> this is in a parking lot. Again, I have a feeling, the way this one develops is, uh, she, different portions of her body and how she trained them and what she did with them. You see, the, oh, this is not things that I work out, but uh, the moment you do this jar, and so you have to go on repeating it for the, what's the next moment in this whole thing. Okay, and then it came to me the thighs, because suddenly the thighs came to life, and then suddenly this bit came to life, and then uh, th this moment happens when I roll up the t-shirt, and then I roll down the uh, whatever this thing, and then there are three tires of tummy, and then I say, you know, uh, that one I had, I can't get the American accent now, Shanti. Um, uh, this one I had, uh, I had, uh, she's been with me a long time, but that one's me. <laughs> I'm still getting to know her. I don't like her. I don't think she likes me. <laughs> and then, of course, there's this thing. And the whole story sort of got embedded, the story got made out of different sections of the body. 
And it was all about a little fragment that I'd read in the papers about a guy, an NRI in America. This is why the American accent. Some Jatinder somebody, and it has to be a Punjabi, probably a sir, because they are the most inventive guys going. He went, he got himself a petrol pump somewhere, I don't know, maybe Texas, where for miles there's nobody, I don't know, maybe they are now. But, <laughs> but and then he, he kind of, I, uh, this I cooked up, but he went to the next gas station and he blew the brains of that guy there and he just took over that gas station and there was nobody to question him because cops are, I don't know, very far away. This is like many years ago, it won't happen today. And so of course then you have to exaggerate that because one comes from a tradition of that. So then he like blows the brains of the third and the fourth. In between he comes home and he gets married to this woman. And then by the time they go back having eloped, um, the third gas station, he gets his legs blown off because the third gas station hears of this Sardar who's going around killing people. So once he gets his le legs blown, she has to pick him up and jog <laughs> from one gas station to the next because you have got to mind the, uh, the what's it called, the way you put your coins and your thing and the pumps. Yeah, whatever. So, so that's how she builds up that. But she's only built up that bit. There's this <laughs> I know you're looking at it. You like a little bit of it. So when Jatinder get picked, gets picked up and goes off to prison, she's all alone. And then the only thing she can do is take hold of it and then she just she just cries herself to sleep. I can give you a little if you want. After the show. And so this, um, you see the thing is that your body is not your own. You can go into an improvisation very self-consciously saying, oh, I'm carrying all of my body into this improvisation. But for me that doesn't work. I get then terribly caught in this person, this everyday person. So if I have to let myself free, I have to actually leave myself out. That's the only way I can open up myself. And that's what we are trying in the, in the morning sessions. And I, uh, yeah, that would be, I, I should not say the rest of that sentence. The context of the fact that most of your pieces are solo performances, yes. what are the possibilities and limitations you discover in that Ooh, form. Well, then she comes with her question, the possibilities and limitations. I was, I was hired to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Fulfilling my contract. For several years, I've not known what it is to have, and I've missed it. Not having an inspired uh, performer with me on the floor. Because they hold, another person holds so many secrets in their own body, in their own person. And nothing like having a co-performer giving you one surprise after another. That's wonderful. But then the other, which is solo. Now, unless I am playing a character like Robinson Crusoe, alone on an island, there is absolutely nothing else that is, can be an imitation of reality in terms of playing solo. You get what I mean? There is no real, there's a play called Woman Alone by Franco Rame, which is all about a woman alone and it's about, you know what the one I mean, I can't remember it now. Franco Rame uh, uh, wrote this text and it's, it's about a woman and she's going nuts being alone, you know, it's all very real. And the audience watching it can identify with moments there because it's an imitation of life on stage. But <coughs> short of that, there is nothing else. So you have to become a medium. If you're standing solo in space, um, it's great because you don't have to play a person anymore. You just become an element in the space. At least that's what happened to me. I just became an element, which meant, means that I can, I can go and become that book, or I can become the atmosphere, or I can sense an energy behind me, or I am nobody. I'm not a person. It's not that I am nobody. I'm not a person. 
I am just a traveling mass of something through which some energies or some imagination or some message is a bit like being a <coughs> shaman, a shaman. Yeah. That something is going to pass through you and you are just a vehicle for something that will come out of you. And so that, 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 that becomes a big challenge. The moment there are two people playing, you can already, um, it already imitates life because I'm going to take from you and you're going to give from me and it's already <coughs> setting up a relationship, a relationship. Here there's nothing about a relationship. I, I'm just there. Well, I don't know if that answers you, but being solo in space, at least for me, has meant that I'm no more a person. But in a moment, I may just say, okay, Mrs. Husband, shut up. Only I was a Mrs. Husband for that one second. Uh, but then I'm already, tra I'm already traveling and Yes. One of your pathways for becoming an element in space is music. And I was wondering, I know we'll be working a little bit with sound this week, but if you could talk about the significance of sound, what does sound open up for you? I remember once, some years ago, you had said to me that you sort of stumbled into the use of sound um, improvising in the studio because what, what you said was, I couldn't stand the silence. And I found that a really interesting, I reflected on that for a while, what it was that sound became a kind of, not just a source of inspiration, but almost like a co-actor, which you just said you don't have, right? So could you say more about sound? Um, uh, having done so many years of Kathakali, even though I've been on the regular stage and with other directors and done uh, King Lear and I played Goneril and I felt those years very self-conscious about <coughs> mouthing words and hearing it. It felt like the falsest thing possible because for me the most believable thing to do was to keep this shut and simply do Kathakali which is not of this world but that felt far more believable than any of mouthing any text of any character. And so I couldn't bear to hear my own voice standing alone in a room and I would run away from myself because I, I thought in those years, that is in 19, uh, I just resigned my job thinking, oh Maya, you're going to become a performer. But I couldn't bear to stand in a room because I, I thought that making solo means you must start with text. Either I will have to bloody write it or somebody will have to give it to me written. And uh, there were no texts around that uh, that felt that I could even halfway pick up and make my own, it was too frightening. So I would stand in the room and oh, try and get used to my voice and it felt so false. Because I wasn't used to it. I was only used to it when a director would direct me and then I would stop listening to myself. If she's happy with it, then that's okay. I'll do it for her, but otherwise it's not for me. Now, the moment you play music, I am in comfortable territory because that's what Kathakali is. He will start singing and the words are spread over a beat and the drums will play and I can settle into my skin. And that's what dancers we are used to. We, we want those cycle of beats that we haven't even heard yet. That will come and we settle into our own skin in the anticipation of those beats that are yet to happen. Because a beat is, a rhythm is not just about the beat, it's about the silences between the beats and what happens in those silences. <coughs> so for me, not that it was familiar because I wasn't standing there doing Kathakali, but it put me in the right moment for expect, expectation <coughs> or Ah, this feels like I can settle in and wait with a sense of comfort, like I don't feel destabilized in the way that listening to my own voice was very destabilizing. Music was both a challenge and comforting. But then, of course, between those beats, I felt like, Who, what's happening here? And it also helped me create this approach towards uh, improvising on your own, 
which is this whole attitude of, oh, what's going to happen here? Oh, what's going to happen here? Oh, what's going to happen here? And the beats of the music, the way they get punctuate, was, was good for feeding the sense of surprise. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that we have time for others' questions, but there's one more question I'd like to ask, and I, I think it's one I actually have never heard anyone ask you um, in, in a public conversation, and that is that you are a teaching artist, and teaching is very important to you, and those of us who had the pleasure of being in the workshop today certainly felt that, not just witnessed it, but, but felt that. And I was wondering if you could, um, Explain to us a little bit about why teaching has been important to you and, and also how teaching has shaped your own practice. That's one of the beautiful things, those of us who are teaching artists, we know that you re-examine your own stuff, you have to articulate things you never articulated to yourself, you figure out you don't know what the hell you're doing, <laughs> and you have to kind of figure out <laughs> Um, so that you can uh, be with someone else. So it'd be really interesting to hear about you, Maya, the teacher. Somehow I so uh, trust uh, that, um, I mean, just going back to music for a moment, the nature of music, or let's call it sound, mm, or somewhere between sound and music, uh, is such that it, uh, you, you, it never quite ends. And, and you're in the middle of it sometimes, or you're, you've slipped back. You can be anywhere on that scale of beats. And you could have rolled back and it's going. But it's, it really is like a co-actor, that you don't know what, what the hell they're going to do next. And if it's a piece of music that is a bit, you've heard it before, but it's not completely familiar, then it's great because it's going to, oh, 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 oh. So it's going to give you surprises, but you don't know the end of the story. That's why I like jamming with, uh, with, with uh, people, uh, with uh, musicians, uh, so that none of us know the end. We don't even know the moment fully that we are in, and already the next moment is revealing itself, and it's all on a plane. And it's palpable, um, but um, I lost sight of the question. Teaching. Uh, teaching. So I know, I know that these things that have excited me as an improviser, they are so laden with so many secrets that I will only begin to sense them if I chuck them out to another lot of people. So the kind of surprises I was getting today from all of you was, uh, you know, to just sit there and I'm not doing a damn thing, I'm just savoring. It's very, very special. It's very special. You also get damn bored of yourself in a room. <laughs> Don't give up anything. <laughs> and, you know, for instance, a director told me, Maya, you get into a room and you start improvising and you're already at level seven before the improvisation has even begun. And I told myself that is a punishment from Patrick. <laughs> so it also punishes. So what is this about being at level zero? For me, that's a very big challenge. So, but when I see people who are not from performing arts and they are in the workshop, like they could be a painter or, a, or whatever, and they, they're not uh, familiar with these performative energies, oh, to watch how they go from where they are at to grasping something of an instruction that I'm giving them is, 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 is wonderful for me to watch. It's absolutely, I take from it. It, it's very inspiring. It also tells me, oh my, you didn't give that, you didn't give that, you must speak so little actually when you're trying to give an exercise. Because it should be full of spaces for them to fill it with the way they want to take away the exercise and interpret it for themselves. Um, um, to watch people's 
And of course, some, you, mm, I can, I can, you saw all sorts of mirror. You, you're not always aware of how you're surprising yourself, but when you're watching somebody else, you have a sense of, oh, I can see she's getting surprised. I can see now she's just, she's just moving and moving and flowing and not really getting surprised. And what there is, because she knows that the exercise is about getting surprised, she's going to, and to be in that tiny moment of the unknown is for me the most precious thing. And then when you see that happen, in contrast to the one where flowy, 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 it's, it's very, very magical. It's like you want to stop. I mean, I am the most privileged in that room to be watching 20 people. I was telling Shanti today at lunch, you don't know what you missed. Some of you got the chance to watch. Yeah, and there was so much to take in when you were watching. But I'm watching all 20 of you. So that's it. Questions from all of you. I have more in my toolkit, but I yeah. encourage you. It's yeah. not a question. It's just somehow we skipped in the beginning from Katharina and Shanti took over. So I couldn't really contextualize like what you were going to um, listen to. And though we printed the bios of both of them, they put pieces of paper. I think what I also want to make very clear is that Shanti, um, who's also a performer and teacher herself, has been researching Maya for over five years now, Shanti, and is writing, will soon be writing on Maya. I think perhaps the most substantial uh, writing. And I think so to have Shanti, it just happened that she was here in India on some kind of, these universities in America often pay their <laughs> teachers to have holidays, something like this. <laughs> so it was just, we were just really lucky that she was here in Pondicherry, Maya was here. And also to say that every festival for us really begins with the question, what is the workshop? It doesn't begin with what is the performance, what can we do? It's what is the workshop and how do we develop a community of... And today in the March Times workshops, we have dancers who come from different cities. And it's really a one moment every year where the community, small though as it, you said it was, comes together to not only attend the workshop, but to attend the shows, to have these conversations. And so the workshop and the way that we can create these moments of discourse around it are super precious to us. And I think it's not easy to condense the vastness of Maya's work into an hour, but I think you, you did an excellent job simply because you, you know her practice so intimately. And I think that has... Uh, and really also so many of us here are experiencing it over the course of, of these days. You know, it's yeah. really beautiful to be able to sort of put into conversation experiential knowledge with conceptual knowledge or theoretical knowledge that we're doing now. Questions? David? When you come across a concept, um, an idea that comes to you, do you actually take that idea and start working on it straight away or do you do your research outside the realm of dance and uh, the creative process uh, because like for instance the western concept concept of uh, fitness that you talked about what how important uh, jogging is for instance or not uh, clearly the stress was about fitness and stamina and uh, and stamina and building stamina we all know the medical benefits of we all know the medical benefits of little to moderate exercise and what it does to your heart. So I'm saying when you, before you have an idea and take it forward and make fun of it, are you concerned about propagating your own uh, sense or nonsense that you want to carry forward or do you do your research outside the realm of creative thinking and dance to actually see if what you're trying to 
communicate makes sense you see i have to keep myself in a state of surprise so i don't tell myself oh next show is going to be like this if i do that then all is lost i really most of the time have to enter a room with no idea and just start improvising and video record those improvisations sometimes the challenge is when you get a commission and somebody says like rustam barucha said will you pick up a character from ramayana and make a show and i said no i won't because i've danced all those characters in kathakali and they are very fulfilling but then suddenly i realize ravana is there my favorite can i play with him and so then you then i researched and i got a but then you have to make it tough for yourself it's not research as in let me know more and more and more and more and more is how we usually think about research for me i want to go like this and like that and like that and like that so that when i get onto the floor i feel challenged and so myth mythology is the greatest because in every corner of our country there is another song about ravana there is another story about him somewhere uh, sita is one thing in another place sita is his daughter so what happens in, what is going to happen in today's improvisation i have no i tell myself i don't know which one of those stories are going to collide with each other understanding in the middle of them and then i wait to see which will so but my for instance the last performance that i made was research because i was asked to make a show on prisoners on death row now you've got to take this damn seriously because these are guys who most of the men who are who <laughs> one of them was told 20 years ago that you're going to get the news so it's been living death for 20 years and he never knows when he's going to get the news so i told myself this is not one of those subjects that i can just walk into an empty space and improvise though maybe i will have to fall back on that as a performer because that's all i know I need to do but i need to take this dance seriously which means i better get to know some of them so i told my host to send me just records and i just kept reading them and reading them because uh, uh, it, it was my responsibility to know them you see how you shift as an artist and you shift in relation to what it is you have to do and if there are people who are waiting for death and i am the artist in between i at my position i have to rejig myself rejig myself and so i read all these stories but then i did walk in i still do have to improvise and so some bits of the improvisation which had uh, uh, really nothing visibly or uh, uh, you couldn't see moments of the research in the improvisation but somewhere they had impacted on the improvisation so then but that took a lot of research and every time i read a fresh story it was bringing down all the possible energies that a performer needs creative energies which need to be double of normal energies they were all getting pulled down and into the ground and so then i told myself now that's a challenge how are you going to re re whirlpool your own energies and fill them up and so i am uh, sorry i'm wearing the wrong costume today I, this again happened and i this is a moment one of an improvisation when i said okay you read 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 and you leave it out the way you leave out and i just sat there on my haunches waiting and the first lines that came to me were der is kamre mein baithne ke baad andhere mein मैं कमरा को नापता हूं एंड आई जस्ट वेंट स्टेपिंग एंड बिकॉज आई वॉज स्टेपिंग सी दिस इज ऑलरेडी फ्रेगमेंटेशन ऑल ऑफ माई माई माइंड एक्चुअली वेंट इन टू माई फीट बट देन समवेर इन द स्टेपिंग it of course was 
this performer trying to find the dimensions of that cell. And I was waiting for that to seep in to know what moment of that research, what 400 million bits of kernels of information that I, I'm just waiting to see which one will come to me. Which one? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I'm at the service of it. But what I'm saying is that it was all residing there. And then, and then you surprise yourself. And I, this is what happened to me that I'm, I was. Uh, or I mean, you all understand Hindi, no? I bump against the wall. And I, then I said, ah, baat hai hai na. Janta to na ki zinda It's only by bumping into the wall that I know I'm alive. And that also came. And then I took some steps forward and said, Jabu plate patakta hai na mere saamne. Usne se itni badbu aati hai lassan ki. And somehow that lassan, which is garlic, left that plate of his and then it somehow went and resided in my intestines. And then because I pushed my body out, I had a sense of my intestines. And when I had a sense of my intestine, another kernel of that research went and resided there. And it became all the sleeping pills that they give me to drug me out. Oh, I had said to the jailer, So, you know, it's a very bodily thing. The body, body is taking the lead to find the imagination of the moment. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for the workshop, first of all, it was wonderful this morning. It's not ending, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I would like to know about the process of writing the text for the performance. Uh, as I remember, uh, I guess it was the performance called The Walk, where you say Ponepaj, Samapaj, Sarpaj. Uh, it always fascinates me how you uh, pick those moments and I have a feeling even in this one, which happened in 2023, there must have been something, you see, this is it, memory. Memory kicks into improvisation, you have no idea where you will dredge it up. So I think the numbers of walk must have kicked in for prisoners on death row. Because there's something, and I think this is down to music and beats and whatnot, that numbers came in. And numbers came in again here. That was also came completely out of improvisation walk. Because they said, come tomorrow. 30th of December 2012, please come tomorrow and be in jail, you know. I said, but I don't have anything and I'm not in a place where now I can make a performance in a day because we were also gutted out. But then that is the challenge. And so what I did was, there happened to be two people sitting there and I said, oh, let's make an advantage of this. There's an audience here. And they were all, there were two theater people who were to help me rehearse a comedy for next month. And I had just told them, I can't rehearse a comedy. No, not now. And this phone call comes. And this is come tomorrow. And I was just telling them, I can't do it because we are still living this uh, horrible rape. And that boy tells me, see, you can do it. They are, you are getting a call, which means into your comedy, you put something of this rape. He just said it in this offhand way. But that became the challenge. Oh God, in the comedy, I'm going to put something of Jyoti Pandey going through this horrible rape. But, and we did that. After having done the performance the next day, and by the way, so, no performer does this. I was holding sheets in my hand like this because I didn't want to miss any of the little things. Everything seemed so urgent those days. That you, I, I, I improvised and I wrote that text down and I'm holding the sheets like this. And at midnight, cold, cold 31st December, some of us, I mean, it was just such a charged night. Mm. But then, of course, walk kept changing. And again, you become of service to the structure of walk. So, Katrina, where she, she was, oh, uh, uh, yeah. So she's witness. She was uh, uh, visiting from uh, Cologne, and we were in a room in JNU, and I was talking about a production, 
and barge come barging in these JNU people and said, oh, you're here, you're giving a talk, you better come and be, well, you better come and visit us where we are on strike. And anyway, why are you giving a talk? You said, we are on strike, you are, this is like breaking the strike. So I said, I'm really sorry, I'm an alum, alumnus, I, I, I'll, I'll come, but can I just finish this last few minutes? Okay, finish quickly and come. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do there? 300 students. So I'm saying that becomes the challenge and the moment becomes the challenge. And so I just took the walk and right there with all of those, I don't know how many hundreds of students, you wait to see the walk is about the numbers. So just keep counting the numbers and the art and the no. And it's all about, you know, it's like a countdown. And you know that when you do a countdown, eight, nine, when you say, Ten, some bulb will go da 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 and you'll be inspired to know what to do in that moment. So that clip is there on YouTube. You can see it. It's all being improvised right there with the with, with, with the students. Is that uh, somewhere what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Just an observation because uh, today on our way back. On our way back from the workshop, there was an actor and two dancers in the car, and this is exactly what we were grappling with. How we found ourselves falling into patterns, though you said anticipate, wait, you know, and go back to your stillness. And then you said on 10, something happens. What happens when nothing happens on the 10? How do you not panic? <laughs> That's always the fear. Even in the workshop, um, the three of us, because we were talking about it, found ourselves falling into comfortable patterns because we were terrified of not doing, I mean, we, we know it's, it's okay to not do anything, but you also, you're a performer. You're there for six days and you want to make something of those six days. You want to make those days count for yourself. So how do you, how do you deal with the anxiety of nothing happening when, at that time? But don't you know from this morning how you were navigating all that? I could see. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's it difficult. It's this thing about hold a body memory. You, you. This is valid. This happens to me as well. Why am I? Why am I doing all this? I mean, it's not. I'm not connected with it. I'm not. We, of course, all of us, the most experienced performer, goes through those moments. But then you. Um, as you know, for me, it's about the eyes that they help me for. And then I'm, I, I have seen it in all, all of you that you all had moments of, oh my God, what is this that's happening? Didn't it happen to you? Yes. So I think we're still learning to trust those moments and yeah, to yeah, yeah. feel a bit confident about it, but yes. But you know, it's like a musician. They do a sargam for years on end. We cannot as actors, and I'm not saying about dancers, Actors imagine, oh, I'll just be inspired and I'll just do it once and that's fine. And the next time they go on stage, the whole damn show is crap, but they imagine another <laughs> Not so, not so. So we all need a practice, and this is a practice. Wow. Preparing the body, preparing the whole edifice, and, wow. and finding another entry into an improvisation. And no, 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 no. I mean, it's a continuous, uh, I mean, I, I've been doing it now for 35 years. This is, what I'm saying is it's a practice. Mm -hmm. so we have to create our own practices in contemporary. Classical musicians have something. Thank you, everyone. See you in the theater. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Maya.